sort of capitalistic benefit, I guess, I'll, I'll answer first, which is it increases enterprise value. It Consumers value it and investors and shareholders also value it. Hey everyone, this is Nazar Akil from Max Pro. Hi, I'm Linda. And I'm Paul. And we're Love and Pebble. Hi, this is Lopa Vandermers from Rasa. Oh, and you're listening. To, and you're listening. And you are listening to, to the e Show. Show. Welcome to the Ecom Show, presented by Blue Tusker, the number one place to hear the inside scoop from other e-commerce experts, where they share their secrets on how they scaled their business and are now living the dream. Now, here is your host, Andrew Mass. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Ecom Show. As usual, I am your host, Andrew Maff, and today I am joined by the amazing Wiley Robinson of Rumpel. Wiley, how are you doing? You ready for a good show? I'm ready for a great show, Andrew. Thanks for having me. This is going to be a good one. I'm super excited to have you here. Um, so obviously, at this point, you guys have, have grown very large. Uh, you had an appearance on Shark Tank. You've been around for, I think, nine plus years at this point. So there's a lot of stuff to go through. However, I'd love to give you kind of the opportunity here to just kind of kick us off, give us a little bit about how you got started, where where you were originally before you got into Rumpel, and we'll go from there. Sure. So I'll start uh, I'll start with where I was. Um, I actually have a design background. So I got a degree in architecture from University of Colorado. Um, following graduating, I sort of migrated my way more into branding. Um, there's, there's a couple of steps I took there, but eventually I found myself at a branding agency uh, called Landor Associates in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And um, really large branding agency. They have like 20 or 20 or so offices around the world um, doing you know all sorts of branding systems for global brands. So obviously identity, but voice, um, you know, content, retail environments, uh, trade show experiences, integrated marketing campaigns, all this, basically every single touch point you might see from a, from a consumer brand. Um, and that gave me like a really good education about creating this holistic experience that sort of identifies the, the brand and its, its identity and, uh, and really its core personality. Um, so that's where I was more, most recently before starting Rumpel. Um, and, uh, I, and so I'll sort of migrate now into the founder story, I guess. Um, it was during a, uh, break I had from work in 2012 and a friend and I took a car ride, um, down the coast of California. We were, we were surfing a bunch on the way down there. And the plan was to head East and drive up through the Sierras skiing on the way back up to San Francisco, which is where we were living at the time. Um, we, we stayed one night in uh, mammoth at some hot springs we knew of out there. And it ended up being like the coldest night on record in mammoth. Um, or in Mammoth, and uh, and we woke up the next morning, car wouldn't start, and we were pretty much just stuck in our car for a bunch of hours until somebody would show up to help us. And we climbed into our sleeping bags and uh, got to talking about how we really liked the feeling of our sleeping bags more than our blankets back home. And it kind of clicked to us, like, well, why wouldn't we just make a blanket out of the same material as a sleeping bag? You know, it's you don't have to wash it as often. It doesn't pick up odor or, or you know, debris. It doesn't you really, it's, it's lower maintenance. Um, and we like mm-hmm. the feeling of, of these materials. So, um, that was the original idea. And, uh, we, we eventually got back to San Francisco and ended up sewing a prototype. And that was kind of the end of the idea. We had no real ambition to start a company at that point. Um, but as we kept using these things and we kept realizing how versatile they were, you know, we would, we would pull them off our bed and bring them out to go to a concert or something, or go hang out in the park in San Francisco. And a bunch of our friends expressed like, hey, this is a really interesting idea. You know, I think I might be interested in something like this. And so at that time, we were still pretty unsure if this was a viable business idea, but we turned to Kickstarter because it's a pretty low, no, low risk way to test the idea. Um, and the Kickstarter did, did really, really well. It ended up, uh, you know, pre-selling about a quarter million dollars uh, in 30 days. So that told us like, OK, this is this is a legitimate idea. We could start a business here. Um, and during that time that that was all happening, that's when we really kind of honed in like what the mission of the company would be, uh, which is introduce the world to better blankets. And the way we think about that is blankets as a category have been relatively unchanged for like thousands of years. I mean, truly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. First, some of the first textiles ever created by humans are, in fact, blankets. And they are these, you know, pretty archaic natural fibers that that uh, make up the vast majority of the category, um, you know, cottons and wools and things like that. They're great materials, but they they lack a lot of the performance that we see in some of the newer textiles that have come through apparel and outdoor gear and sporting goods. 
And really what we're trying to do at Rumpel is just draft off of some of those textile innovations that are happening in those categories and use those innovations for this form factor and for this category. So that's the big picture of the, of the company and, and what we're really trying to accomplish. Now, the concept of the company has also kind of evolved since then, because I know you've, you've definitely gone into a sustainability approach. You're now benefiting other designers. Like what kind of had you, uh, or I, I guess I should say, at what point did you realize like, okay, we need to take this now into almost these, this more modern era of building a brand around sustainability and having a cause and, you know, all, all of the, the rights around that that happens there. So what kind of made you move that direction? Yeah, so I'll go, I'll go back again to the mission of the company, which is introduce the world to better blankets. And we, we took a long time kind of thinking about like what in fact makes a blanket better. And what we came to was, was two very distinct things. Number one is the materials that we're using in the product. So I kind of already touched on that. And that's, that's fairly on the nose. It's obvious, you know, you take performance materials and use them in this, this form factor. And there you have it, a, a higher performing product. That's the first piece. The second piece, uh, which speaks to all the things you're talking about, is really developing an emotional connection with the customer for a product category that is already highly emotive. Right. So the way you use a blanket is you wrap up in it to feel warm and cozy and comfortable. It's like this. It's actually this very sort of tactile, you know, warming <laughs> uh, experience that you have with the product. And it's highly emotive inherently. And so our goal with doing things like becoming a, a, a B Corp, um, you know, climate neutral, one percent for the plan, all the artist partnerships is really developing a brand that people love. Obviously, like morally, we want to be doing those things as well. You know, like we want to we want to build a business responsibly. Um, but consumers value that as well. And so it enhances the emotional connection they have with the brand and effectively with the product that they're experiencing. So that that to us also makes this a, quote, better blanket if it's got that yeah. emotional connection to it. And you mentioned the B Corp. We've had a, a few sellers on the show before that have gone in that direction. What made you kind of turn the company into a B Corp and, and start down that journey? Yeah, I mean, it's something that we've always wanted to do since since the beginning, but the the administrative lift of converting to a B Corp is significant. Yeah. Um, and we we ended up looking into it more, and I can tell you about how we ended up doing that um, in a second. But we were actually operating pretty much like a B Corp. We, we really didn't have to change much about the fundamentals of the company at all in order to qualify. We just had to track it and had to record all of it. Um, you know, a couple of things like we have a couple of policies at the company that weren't sort of formalized into policy documents, um, you know, re relating to, you know, paternal leave um, and and uh, or excuse me, paternity leave, maternity leave and uh, a, a variety of other sort of employee benefits that we offer at the company. Um, and we didn't have like formal documents expressing those. So part of becoming a B Corp was actually just formalizing a lot of things we were already doing. Yeah. Um, and so the way that we actually did the administrative lift of it, which again is really significant, is uh, we were approached by a student at Western Colorado University who was doing an MBA program in sustainability. And his capstone, like thesis, final project was he wanted to find an outdoor brand that he could help shepherd into B Corp status. And he was a big fan of Rumpel and approached us at, at a trade show. And I thought, well, yeah, this is this is a great, this is a win-win here. You know, like you'll, you'll yeah, satisfy really? the ask of your, of your thesis project. And, you know, hopefully we can come out of this with a B Corp certification. And I think both of us were overwhelmed with the amount of work that it ended up being. Mm -hmm. um, when we were first starting down the path, it was like, you know, do you have recycling in the office? And we were like, yeah, check. We're going to, this is going to be easy. And, and, uh, you know, 800 questions later and factory audits and, you know, like really a lot of clerical work. Um, yeah. We finally were in a place where we were ready to submit and ended up achieving uh, B Corp status. So we were super proud of that. How long did that take you to go through the entire step from from when you met this person at the trade show to finally getting awarded the B Corp? Probably six to seven months, I would say. Wow. Um, and, and I was checking in with him weekly for an hour mm -hmm. or two, and we'd go through this self-assessment that you fill out. So basically what you do is you do like a self-audit. Um, you, you, they have a whole scorecard and you fill it out for yourself on your own behalf. You submit it then to B lab and then they verify all of your claims. So they come back, they ask for receipts, they ask for certifications, they ask for formal policy documents like the one I was talking about. And they say, okay, yes, they say they're doing these things. They are in fact doing them. 
Wow. And that was just a, a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. A lot of questions and a lot of verification needed by B-Lab. I say you're, that's so far the most common answer we got is that it takes forever and is a nightmare in terms of admin. What's uh, for, for your side of things outside of the obvious of the label, what is the benefit for Rumpel being a B Corp? I mean, the, the sort of capitalistic benefit, I guess I'll, I'll answer first, which is it, it increases enterprise value unquestionably, mm-hmm. you know, it's, yeah. it's, of it, it, it Consumers value it and investors and shareholders also value it. Um, and, and presumably it leads to more sales. You know, it's really tough to quantify that, but there is, there is plenty of validation that consumers care about this stuff and they buy from businesses that have that B Corp status. On the personal level and the moral level, you know, I, in, in running this business, and I would say anybody that runs a consumer business that cares about the environment and cares about our impact on the planet, you know, you see firsthand when you visit your factories, like, Wow, we're actually like you know having an impact here. Um, we're we're it would the the best thing that you could do as a business for the environment would be to shut down your business. I mean, truly, like to not actually produce the goods <laughs> that you're producing, and that's that's the real truth. Um, yeah. No one wants to admit that, but that is the truth. And so, by doing things like getting B Corp certification or offsetting your carbon or donating to causes like through One Percent for the Planet, um, it at least uh, offsets some of the damage you're causing by the inherent nature of running a business. So it, it feels good morally, personally, to at least uh, feel like we're making an effort and a step in the right direction there. Yeah. So you mentioned um, you know, your factories and having to go through that whole process. Are you, uh, is most of the product made here in the U.S.? Do you, are you outsourcing it at all? Is it a mix of both? What's your process there? Yeah, it's, it's all entirely coming out of Southern China. And um, we do that for a couple of reasons. I mean, Fundamentally, China has a comparative advantage and an absolute advantage in producing performance textiles. So mm-hmm. it's the nation with the lowest opportunity cost to produce these types of products. Um, and they also can produce the most of it and the best of it. Um, and so it's it's the obvious choice for us to go. That's where the vast majority of the apparel performance apparel industry uh, is, is produced. Um, and, and part of the B Corp certification was auditing all of the supply chain you know, overseas, making sure that we are operating out of mills and factories that are not in conflict zones, making sure that the transportation between these these different touch points is minimized as much as possible, making sure that, you know, the car, another part of it is the carbon we offset each year. We track all of the carbon from each of those legs of the supply chain overseas and offset all those carbon emissions as well. So it's, it's, uh, it's definitely not easier to make things in Asia. Um, mm-hmm. I think that that's a, a common misconception. It's uh, it's just you get better output, um, you get you get better quality product, you get more access to raw materials, um, and uh, you can do it faster. Um, yeah. So it's the obvious place to make things. We've done explorations around making things closer to the U.S. Um, and uh, and the real advantage really is the is the sea freight, um, you know. And sometimes you get some duty and tariff benefits as well, but generally the product is not superior, at least in our category that we found closer to states. Yeah. Do you have to, so obviously you think of, uh, of performance materials, you think of like Under Armour and Nike and, and, you know, Adidas and all these guys, every time they come out and they, you know, have somehow improved upon the performance material that they have, do you go back and relook at, okay, what did they make and see if you can start sourcing that? Or have you kind of developed your own, uh, you know, proprietary blend of everything? What's, what's the process like there? Yeah. I mean, generally speaking, we don't have a lot of proprietary materials. We do have one insulation type that we develop called Nanoloft. Um, mm-hmm. it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a small uh, filament that's, that's basically balled up and creates a small little ball that mimics down. Um, that is something that we developed and trademarked, but, but that's a very small percentage of our total product portfolio. Um, the vast majority of our product is made using what would be considered off-the-shelf material. It's, it's recycled 30D polyester and a siliconized hollow fiber insulation, which is readily available and used in a lot of other companies' products. Um, to your question about do we track market trends, for sure. Yeah, I mean, we don't necessarily act on all of them, but we definitely try to stay aware of what's popular in apparel, what's popular in outdoor gear, athletic equipment, all that stuff. And we haven't leveraged a lot of it, you know, honestly. Like, we our, our product portfolio is not that broad. Um, yeah. And... Uh, that's largely because we're still a pretty new company 
And we want to make sure that when customers find out about us or see us for the first time, it's a really concise message that they get. It's like, oh, they make these cool blankets. You know, that's yeah. that's the main thing they do. Um, and I think if we came out with too many products with too many different technology tags, it could become confusing to that customer that's coming to us for the first time. Once the brand is has you know penetrated more of, of the world, <laughs> more of the country, more of the world, there's more brand awareness. That's a time when we might consider expanding future product lines and leveraging some of those other materials that are that are developed by bigger companies. Yeah, you mentioned that you're a newer company. Um, granted, it's, you know it's always interesting to hear people refer to themselves as whether they're a new company, they've been around for a long time. We've interviewed uh, people on the show that have been around for a hundred plus years, which was crazy. Mm -hmm. And then we have others that are newer because they've been around for a few years, but you're kind of at like that nine, 10 year mark ish. Mm -hmm. What is it that you kind of like, what makes you feel like you guys are kind of a newer company? A couple things. I mean, first and foremost, the category itself that we're trying to, to introduce is very much a new category. You know, blankets yeah. have been around, but this is, we really believe this is an evolution of that category. And so that's a new thing for consumers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so positioning wise, our brand and our product offering is new, you know, quote unquote. Um, additionally, we really didn't kind of start scaling super fast until probably three years ago, you know, starting from zero, we were kind of chugging along and I think we reached probably $5 million in revenue by year three or four. And really after that is when it started scaling. So yeah. the brand awareness that we generated in those first three, four years was, was really pretty insignificant. Um, and you know, we just didn't come out of the gate as fast as some other companies, but we've, we've really picked up over the last few years. And so I think that for most people, they might look at Rumpel and think that it's, you know, a two, three, four year old company, but yeah. we were kind of hovering around that, you know, smaller stage for quite a while also. Did, so you had mentioned in the beginning, you know, that this was an idea that was kind of spurred from a trip with you and your buddy up to Mammoth. Uh, and you know, you had this idea at what point, once you released it, did you start to see competition coming into the market after? Because I know you mentioned you did a Kickstarter campaign, did 250 in the first 30 days. Obviously, you've kind of put it out into the public at that point. Did mm -hmm. you? At what point did you start seeing competition coming in? We started seeing competition pretty quickly, but it was largely sort of direct from factory Amazon type knockoff yeah. product. Mm -hmm. uh, it really wasn't until probably... I would say three years in that we saw like real brands coming out with similar products, um, you know, brands that actually have some momentum and some traction and do other things well, and they're known by customers. So now it's rampant. I mean, there's like tons of, you know, rumbles yeah. out there uh, that are that are made by reputable brands. So, um, yeah, it was probably two, three years. And I would say that like a real brand competitor uh, we saw. Yeah. So you started to ramp up, you said about three-ish years ago, give or take. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, though, I believe it was last year that you went on to Shark Tank and did that whole approach. What made you decide to go on to the show if you were kind of already starting to see some growth from the year or two prior? Uh, so 2020 was the, was the Shark Tank year, so about two years ago. Um, yeah. But we went on just because, you know, I for, for a long time, I sort of I don't know, snubbed my nose a little bit at going on that. It was like, ah, you know, we're an established business. I'm going to get torn apart if I go. And to some extent I did also. Um, yeah, but you weren't wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I just thought like this is an opportunity to, to broadcast the brand and the product to 5 million people. You know, it's a huge mm -hmm. audience that watches that show. Um, I thought that, you know, I, I did go on wanting to actually strike a deal to help us expand into licensing. Now, We've ended up doing it on our own, um, yeah, but, uh, but that was definitely, you know, I, I think that it could have been, uh, I think it could have been accelerated with help from a shark. I mean, I, I do think that inroads to those leagues can be established more easily if you have a reputable backer behind you um, yeah. that they may have the ability to knock down some doors. So, uh, you know, went in thinking that this is, this is kind of a, a new territory for the brand. You know, we're largely an outdoor brand sold on outdoor channels and we're trying this thing with NFL and licensed product and more mainstream sports. And, uh, and that's a big sort of divergence from where we've been historically. And so it's almost like I wanted to bring in a new partner and new capital and new resources to do this expansion project. Um, and, uh, yeah, of course I could have, and what we ended up doing is we used our own internal resources to do it. Um, it's just a bigger gamble doing it that way, you know, mm -hmm. 
And so uh, what ended up making me want to go on there was was uh, the exposure for sure, but also getting a new partner that could help with this extension for the brand. Yeah. So you, you obviously, as you mentioned, got the licensing. It's now available on your site. You, yep. um, you know, so you expanded the product line, at least from a, a design aspect in, in that way. And then I also know that you developed a program. I believe it's a rad, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, Rumpel, uh, forgive me, Rumpel, Rumpel Artist Artists Division. Yeah. Division. Thank you. I was like, what's the D? Um, <laughs> so what's, what is that whole, <laughs> what's that whole process like? So what made you kind of go into, uh, you know, essentially you're bringing in, these talented artists to submit design work that then, you know, I, I, what's that process like of selecting what actually gets made? Yeah. So, so, uh, just real quickly, uh, going back a little bit also again, to just anchor why we do it. Uh, it, it's again, part of that desire to create that emotional connection with the customer and make, yeah. make a memorable product that they really care about, not just kind of some commodity blanket that uses these technologies. Um, so with the rad program, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's actually very different depending on the artist. Um, some artists approach us, other artists, we approach other artists we're introduced to through artists we've worked with previously. Um, mm -hmm. and, and also the creation of the piece that we ended up, that we end up using is, is always very different. So sometimes, uh, you know, it's an artist that say, Hey, I've got this thing that I, you know, have worked with a couple other brands on and I, I put this pattern on anything and it sells really well and it does really well and raises awareness about this thing I'm trying to talk about. And we say, okay, perfect. Let's use that art. Other times we really care a lot about having bespoke art, um, and, and essentially commissioning art where we, where we sort of art direct them a little bit and tell them what we want the look and feel to be. Um, and they create a completely new bespoke piece. It also is very different depending on, uh, what the artist wants in terms of compensation. You know, some artists want to get um, some sort of percentage of sales. Other artists want to have one flat upfront payment. Other artists, if it's a, if it's an already created piece, you know, maybe it's a licensing agreement. Other artists actually just want us to donate a percentage of proceeds to some cause they care about. We worked with Stefan Sagmeister uh, a year or two ago. He's a super famous graphic designer out of New York, and he didn't want any compensation for the product at all. He just wanted us to donate 10 percent of proceeds to the New York City High Line. So we, we happily do that stuff. Um, all in, we try to keep the margin on those products about the same. So whether it's 10% going to Stefan or 10% going to New York City Highline or something in that neighborhood, um, mm -hmm. we just want to make sure that the margin stays relatively intact there. But where the money goes, you know, it's, it's very flexible. You know, from, from a business perspective, I, I love the concept because it's, it's almost like you're, you're reducing your costs, obviously, not needing to have too many designers on staff. Granted, I know you were a designer at one point. Which actually sparks another question. At what point did you stop designing for Rumpel or have you? I mean, I definitely still weigh in. <laughs> I'm, yeah, not, well. I'm, not, uh, <laughs> I'm not creating a lot of the art, you know, from scratch myself, but I'm definitely still involved when we're doing our line planning and, and uh, determining which directions we want to pursue and continue developing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't, I don't open Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop very often these days. Yeah. Um, I probably have it for that. a few years, actually, at this point. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so uh, like I was saying, like, it, it's really interesting because I, I imagine you reduce your cost of having too many designers on staff at any time. You're also basically taking in outside sources that probably have audiences that may not have heard from you. The chances of them obviously helping promote it to a certain extent are pretty beneficial as well. Like it is a very smart approach to expanding the product line while keeping sale, uh, while keeping uh, your costs down and while getting that extra marketing out of it. Like it's a uh, it's very win win across the board. What kind of sparked the idea behind putting this program together? Yeah, so I, I would say just as a, as a point of clarity, I do think that it is accretive to our, our bottom line. Like it does help us reduce costs. However, I think the cost savings don't necessarily come in a reduced headcount necessity here. I think it actually mm -hmm. comes more in the form of we don't have to spend as much marketing the product because the artist does the marketing. That's so that's, that's actually where I would say that the efficiency comes in. Um, but, uh, I'm sorry, what was, what was the original question there that you were getting at? Uh, what, what sparked the idea to just put oh, this, um, yeah. to get the program together? I mean, it came from the fact that, that, uh, we started putting our own art on there and we realized that we have this huge canvas, you know, like we have definitively the biggest canvas in apparel or outdoor <laughs> of any yeah. brand. Um, and so, uh, we, we realized what type of printing technology we had access to. 
it was pretty good at the time. We've actually done a lot to develop it. Um, and, and we just thought this is a perfect canvas for an artist to express themselves and we can tell a cool story. We can have them help us market it. Uh, and, you know, again, going back to creating that emotional connection, we can create really beautiful bespoke pieces that connect with consumers in a more meaningful mm -hmm. way. So it was kind of obvious. It wasn't, honestly, it wasn't, it wasn't really backed into with like a really sophisticated financial model about how like this is going to save us on costs and all that. It's ended up in some cases helping us in that way. In other cases, you know, sometimes we, we hire an artist and we pay them a bunch of money and the, and the print doesn't really hit <laughs> and we ended up having to spend money marketing it and, and moving through the units. So yeah. it's not, oh, you know, it would be, in, we haven't done an analysis where we've determined like this is accretive or, or, uh, challenges our bottom line. Um, but overall, it's a good program that consumers really like. So we're going to keep doing it. Yeah. So obviously you came up with this plan. Like there, there's so many aspects that have been built over the past, you know, nine plus years that you guys have been around. Um, and I'm basing that off of just what your LinkedIn says. Is that, is it nine plus years? Like since you were in that car and came up with the idea? Yeah. Since, since I was in the okay. car, we, we technically incorporated <laughs> in March of 2014. Okay. So we're, you know, yeah, eight, we're close. in our eighth year here. Yeah. Pretty yeah, close. Yeah. yeah. So within eight years, you mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, you're pretty much your first month. You did a quarter of a million on, on Kickstarter, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned it took some time to grow. Now you have far surpassed eight figures, uh, annually. What, what do you think is from a founder's perspective, from your perspective specifically, what do you think was your specific, like, thing that helped you get it to that point and then just as a business as the whole like what helped you guys kind of continue on that path and be able to get to where you are now yeah i think i think for me specifically um i'm a huge believer in coaching uh you know prior to prior to rumple i was a designer i had managed like one or two people ever in my life i, I had no background in finance i never used you know any sort of modeling software for you know no excel no google sheets none of that um, mm. and, uh, and I didn't have a lot of management experience and systems process. I was very much like on the creative sort of end of the, of the professional spectrum. And so I've had to rely on a lot of advice from mentors and coaches and advisors to level me up and level my skill set up to be able to be a CEO, um, and, and to scale as a CEO, you know, like when, when the company is, you know, three or five employees, you can kind of still be you know, whatever it is you're, you're naturally good at, and you're sort of working as a group together to get the thing to the next, to the next hurdle. Um, now we're, you know, 40 plus employees and there's a number of layers between me and, and some of the other people that work at the company. And so, um, learning how to delegate, learning how to prioritize things that really matter, learning how to, how to listen to the, to the team and, um, understand where good ideas are coming from. Um, that all for me has taken a lot of practice and coaching. And working with people that have done it, um, yeah. and so that's that's been a big part of my journey and my my evolution. As far as the company goes, I would say it's pretty similar. Actually, it's it's leveraging the advice of people that we trust that we have in our network to tell us, um, you know, what the best next move is. Uh, you know, the scaling scaling fundamentally is not just about earning more money. It's about developing processes and systems that allow uh, allow people to be more efficient. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've taken a lot of cues from advisors we have about when the time is right to do things like, you know, implement an ERP or bring in a sales agency or in-house some marketing thing we were doing. Um, and, you know, being really strategic and cautious about when we do those things so we don't do it prematurely or sandbag ourselves with implementing some new process um, and not actually focusing on growing the business. So it's... It's, I wouldn't say there's like a silver bullet answer to that. It's just been an evolution where we kind of keep an eye on what the business needs, what I need to, to uh, be as the CEO of the business and uh, putting energy and time and resources towards accomplishing those things. Beautiful. Wiley, I don't want to take too much more of your time. Obviously, I really appreciate you having you on the show. I would love to give you an opportunity here to just kind of let everyone know where they can find out more about you know yourself and obviously Rumpel. Sure. So the easiest way is rumple.com. That's our website, uh, rumpl.com. You can also, of course, check out all of our social links. Um, we're sold in, you know, over a thousand retail doors across the country. Some of our bigger accounts are REI, Dick's Sporting Goods, Bass Pro Cabela's, 
um, and, and, you know, five or 600 other accounts, uh, that, you know, are probably close to where you live. So check them out. We have a dealer locator on our website. Perfect. Wiley, really appreciate having you on the show. Obviously everyone else who tuned in, thank you so much for tuning in. Obviously, uh, make sure you rate review, subscribe on all the fun places, whether you're on Apple podcasts or Spotify or YouTube or go to ecomshow.com. But as usual, thanks again. And we will see you all next time. Have a good one. Thank you for tuning in to the Ecom Show. Head over to ecomshow.com to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or on the Blue Tusker YouTube channel. The Ecom Show is brought to you by Blue Tusker, a full service digital marketing company specifically for e commerce sellers looking to accelerate their growth. Go to bluetusker.com now for more information. Make sure to tune in next week for another amazing episode of the Ecom Show.